So we're back again for another breakfast soapbox. Uh, we've kind of wanted to do this video for a while now, but we kind of just didn't have the time. And this breakfast soapbox will be labeled Breakfast Soapbox 17. We kind of have a stack of videos sitting around that we're trying to get caught up with. And like I mentioned, so, we had this one worked out before, just didn't get around to it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, having a YouTube channel is really interesting because it puts you in contact with so many different types of people. Active witnesses um, are some of those that really express to you their struggles inside the organization. And the reason of those struggles kind of runs the gamut. And the subject matter of this video sort of proves that. It's interesting that though the subject matter of all the struggles varies widely, there's an underlying theme in all these organizational struggles. And we'll discuss that at the end here in this video. So, as the title here indicates, the subject matter on this video is the Flat Earth Debate. Now, before you roll your eyes, know that it's not as clear-cut as it may seem. Now, these people aren't dense Neanderthals that believe this. Uh, some of them, in fact, are pretty intelligent, and some of the arguments are pretty compelling at face value. And we're not going to get into all the debates surrounding whether the Earth is round or flat or polygon, for that matter. <laughs> there are plenty of videos out there to discuss that. But we want to discuss a deeper issue here. So I was talking to this active witness who was discussing a flat earth. And it just so happens that he is also being threatened with disfellowshipping for discussing the subject of a flat earth. And again, some people may be saying, why are you even considering or listening to this nonsense? It's just stupid garbage. Well, I'd respond with the statement of, I've had a few people call me arrogant because of my bold demeanor. But the fact of the matter is, arrogance is not a simple visible personality trait of boldness. Arrogance shows itself in action of thought. Arrogance, as defined, is an overestimation of one's abilities or importance. To illustrate the misconception of arrogance, were the prophets bold or were they arrogant? You might see that that's kind of a trick question. Because your view, no doubt, depends on whose side of the argument you are on. Because prophets weren't known as false prophets or true prophets until after the events unfolded. Sometimes both the true prophets and the false prophets claimed to speak in Jehovah's name. And the true prophets were called arrogant by the false prophets of God's established organization. Yeah, Jeremiah is a perfect example. But it wasn't until after the events were borne out that the true prophets were validated by the truths that they spoke. And the arrogance was actually shown to be on the, now proven to be, false prophet. Nowadays, most sane people don't claim to be prophets in the same sense of predicting events as they did back then. Most realize we have established biblical truth to rely on. And to restate, the subject matter here isn't necessarily a biblical understanding. It's a scientific one primarily that we're talking about. So to call someone stupid just because they believe something differently than you or take longer to come to a conclusion than you, really because of your inability to prove it to them, that's what arrogance in action is. Scripturally speaking, telling someone who doesn't understand the same thing as you when you can't definitively prove it by scripture, that they're stupid, against God, mentally diseased apostate, just because they want to test established understanding themselves, to me, that epitomizes arrogance and action. To be clear, in the end, for me, there were some fairly simple ways to debunk some of the reasoning points given for a flat earth. And I don't think the person that I was talking to really wanted to consider all of those debunking points. It reminds me of Trinity. Sometimes the reason a person believes something is simply just because they want to believe something. As opposed to setting aside their emotion or their opinions and just looking at all the facts of a specific subject matter. But that's on them. Hmm. But unlike the existence or the nature of God... This doesn't seem like a theological issue. It's a scientific one. And I will say, at the same time, some of the arguments given for a flat earth were very compelling and challenged some of the things that I thought that I knew. 
And at the end of the day, I couldn't prove some of those points wrong without the establishment's understanding. In other words, I can't just walk out my front door here today and definitively prove to a person what shape the earth is. And speaking of the establishment's understanding, think the world's understanding. For a Jehovah's Witness, isn't the whole world lying in the power of the wicked one? The one who's deceiving the entire inhabited earth? Right. To play devil's advocate here, if Satan could pull that off as a deception, fooling everyone into believing the world is round when the earth is actually flat, wouldn't that be the ultimate argument for Satan as a deception? As if to say, if I can deceive them into believing that, I can fool them of anything. I mean, has the so-called faithful slave sent a governing body member up into the reaches of the upper atmosphere to prove that it's not all just a big Hollywood hoax set up by the establishment? <laughs> Have they proved that that's not what Area 51 is? Are they spending their millions of dollars to prove that the Earth is round by personally circumnavigating it? To definitively prove that we haven't been duped by the entire governmental, commercial, scientific, and religious world under Satan's control? Again, we're not saying we buy into this, but is this what Christian faith has come down to? Agreeing with the scientific status quo all of the time? How's that any different than the burning of the stake of Giorgiano Bruno or the imprisonment of Galileo? Both carried out by the Catholic Church. Is it the fact of whether or not they were right or wrong that determines whether or not they should have been executed or imprisoned? Or is it the general principle that an individual has a right to believe and do research to support that belief or perhaps even eventually disprove it, if it's not what the church agrees with? Especially if it's just a scientific understanding? I mean, is this really a subject of major biblical doctrine here? The Catholics sure thought so. <laughs> True. But hasn't this been played out already, the dangers of the church officially supporting a certain scientific belief? Hasn't the Catholic Church already proven this folly? Is that what the Christ came to do? Set scientific doctrine? Did he go out to involve himself in scientific debates of the world? Again, as Tiffany said before, we're not saying that we buy into this whole flat earth thing. But doesn't this show pretty vividly the overreach of power has just gone a bit too far to understate the obvious? I mean, really, what difference does it make if someone believes the earth is flat, round, or a trapezoid for that matter? Does it really affect Christian morality? Did the Apostle Paul come speaking extravagance of wisdom in scientific affairs? I mean, doesn't a person have the scriptural right to research a subject matter until it has been definitively proved one way or another to him to where it satisfies his own curiosity? Now to clarify that, not what satisfies you or what satisfies me or her, but what satisfies that individual and his questions especially in scientific matters. I mean, what difference does it make if this guy does the research and he comes to the exact same conclusion that you do, or vice versa, we come to the same conclusion as him, eight years later? Or he comes to the same conclusion eight decades after you do? Let's say it takes 150 years, whether in this system or the next, for everyone to have access to a spaceship to be able to go up into space and see with their own eyeballs the shape of the Earth. In the grand biblical scheme of things, does it really matter if it takes an individual 200 years to come to that understanding? 800 years? Who cares? Is this what Christian faith has come down to? Being disfellowship because you have the desire to discuss or, God forbid, contradict a scientific understanding? What, are you going to disfellowship a child because he asks challenging questions to learn? Aren't we all children of God and children to God? Yeah, I mean, don't we all learn a little bit differently? Some learn by testing the status quo. And guess what? Sometimes that's led to massive advances in understanding. What's next? Will it be apostasy to discuss the composition of the sun or its distance from the earth? 
or the composition of black holes or dark matter? Yes, the scripture says Christians should have one faith. But that doesn't mean that some congregational hierarchy gets to set forth some dogma and everyone must follow whatever they say that can't be proven with scripture. What unity means is you should humbly not go beyond the things written so as to puff yourself up in favor of the others, elevating yourself. I had this debate with an elder over email. He kindly invited me to write to him as a way to express myself. Since a face-to-face -face discussion is sometimes difficult for me to express my thoughts because they get jammed up in my head. But when he solidly got out-reasoned, he quit replying, and the emails became a basis to start acquiring evidence against us to disfellowship us. So this is an excerpt from one of the emails that I wrote to him. Quote, The freedom to allow Jehovah to form my faith, as long as I stay within biblical standards, should not be hampered. I quote 1 Thessalonians 5.19 You asked, well, where do we draw the line? The article continues with that answer. The article I'm referring to is Learn From Me, and it continues on that statement in paragraph 21. Essentially, people felt refreshed by Jesus, uplifted and encouraged. Where God's law was definite, it meant what it said. If it seemed general, their conscience would come more into play and they could show their love for God by their decisions. The law gave them room to live and breathe. God loved his people, worked constantly for their good, and was willing to be merciful when they faltered. Jesus was like that. That was a Out of the Watchtower article. Again, the article was learned from me. So as you can see there, the question that the elder asked, well, where do we draw the line? As the article clearly stated, where God's law was definite, it meant what it says. If the Bible isn't specific, a Christian conscience based on his faith comes into play. That brings us to the underlying issue I mentioned in the beginning of the video. The ability to form one's own faith. You see, elders are no longer spiritually qualified. Whoa, Chad, you're way out of line to say that. Oh, but I didn't. A circuit overseer said it, <laughs> which I'll relate here in a minute. But first, let's get back to the point about the elders. Instead of helping someone come to a correct understanding, if the elders can't prove a dogma or even if it becomes difficult for an elder to prove something that's true, but because of not truly being spiritually qualified to reprove those who contradict. And just to be clear, reprove doesn't mean beating down opposers with punishment. It means to reprove or to prove again, as some translations put it, successfully refuting or show where they are wrong. And so when these elders can't do that, they just beat their fellow slaves and disfellowship them. As proof that elders are not spiritually qualified, I'd like to read an excerpt of a letter I wrote to a CEO. Quote, You mentioned some elders get flustered when people ask the elders to show them a scripture or an article. What? How can that be? Is this not God's spirit-directed organization that appointed them as elders with God's spirit? No reasonable person expects the elders to remember everything right then and right there, do they? Proverbs 15.28 So what's wrong with using God's spirit and applying what we learn to do at the door? In a kindly manner, let me do some research on that and I'll get back to you. Jehovah is not using earthly geniuses, is he? Isn't Jehovah using those who are being led by his spirit? Proverbs 1.7.7.1 Romans 8.14 If those elders can't do that, how did they get to be elders? And if they forgot how to do that, shouldn't they get a refresher course in God's spirit? Hebrews 4.12-14 for can we do anything good without God's Spirit? Is that not what the door-to-door -door work is preparing us brothers for? 
how to handle Jehovah's sheep? After all, do we practice washing dishes with Grandma's fine china first? Do we not treat the world with care and treat our family with even extra care? Galatians 6.10 Did not you yourself state, we don't just let down our spiritual guard because we are in our own house, do we? We should be extra careful, kind, and courteous. That was his own statement. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17, Proverbs 14, 1. End quote of my letter to him, in part. Well, if they're getting flustered asking for a scripture, that means one of two things. Either the organization is not preparing them with the truth on certain subjects, which is God's spirit, or they're not training them to use God's spirit when they meet up with a brother who may be well superior to them in intelligence, reasoning, persuasiveness, or understanding. So, since the elders lack God's spirit, they instead just disfellowship the one who has questions because the elders' inadequacies in comparison to the other person. Being spiritually qualified is not your ability to be a sycophant that schmoozes his way into a position. But rather, being spiritually qualified includes the ability to prove, prove again, reprove, scripturally, and reason definitively on a subject for a belief. But again, instead of helping someone come to the correct understanding, if an elder can't prove a dogma, or even if it becomes difficult for an elder to prove something that's true, instead of humbling themselves to learn so that they can teach, their arrogance in their stand directs them to the process of cutting off, executing, imprisoning by disfellowshipping anyone as a heretic or apostate who wants to ask questions on things that may even be of a spiritually trivial nature and have nothing to do with the one faith that the Bible speaks of. That's really the larger issue at hand. And it's the failure at the top that doesn't correct the daily abuses and injustices that happen at the congregation level. Exactly. Oppressing questions with abusive authority doesn't remove the questions. It's like plucking off the top of the dandelion. It just forces the roots deeper and the plant comes back bigger. To remove strongly entrenched things or to uproot them, as the scriptures say to do, and draw someone out, in other words, allow them to freely express themselves without fear of reprisals, and then reason with them, not by just giving them a watchtower with a not-so-veiled threat, and on top of that, a watchtower that may be erroneous on the subject, and may in fact contain the errors that even possibly raise the questions in the first place. Besides, in a congregation setting, won't the truth win out? Isn't the congregation, not organization, a pillar and support of the truth? Are Christians not big enough to accept differences of details and understanding? <laughs> so as a case in point, during a watchtower study that was talking about how the anointed were just going to be caught away in the clouds and it was starting to smack a whole lot like uh, the rapture, a brother went right along with the watchtower's comment in saying, the, the, whatever it was about this, they were going to be caught away in the clouds. I raised my hand and I referred back to Paul's words, who said that the grain of wheat was going to die again. That brother raised his hand right back and the watchtower conductor called on him right back and he read another st statement out of the watchtower that said basically the same thing. I raised my hand again. He called right back on me. So here we are basically having a discussion about a finite point in the watchtower. I again quoted the scripture that said a very similar thing in Jesus' word, that the grain of wheat has to die first before it can bear much fruit. So I said, I guess we'll have to see about that. So again, here we are having this finite discussion on a specific point in the watchtower in scripture. Were we at odds forever after that? Did we have hard feelings? Well, I know I didn't, but later on he was a uh, witness in my disfellowshipping. Uh, I don't even know if I should mention that. Could 
because I don't know. That's a, that's a really good point as far as when you say, I'm sorry, but what I've learned about people in this organization is that they absolutely cannot stand to be corrected or, or uh, like, you're not going to tell me what's what. Yeah. And that's the way he is. Yeah. That's the way they are. And if you're trying to get ahead in hierarchy, that's definitely their attitude. Yeah. So here we are, having a detailed discussion on a finite point in the watchtower and in the scriptures, back and forth with one another, in opposite sides of this discussion. So did that mean that after that, we weren't big enough Christians to just get over it and and carry on without holding some sort of a grudge? Well, as far as I know, there was no problems between us after that, and we pioneered together after that. So yes, unity and peace can exist without the droning of every single detailed hierarchical whim. And scripturally speaking, the congregation or organization has no business oppressing a person's research in scientific affairs. It's just disgustingly going beyond the things written. So if you like the general principle of this breakfast soapbox, check out this one.